and a professor in ethics of technology at the University of Eindhoven. But he has a background as living in Britain. He went to Warwick where he was an early career innovation fellow and in between he has been at Delft where he was a Mari Slodowska Curie Research Fellow. So Matthew's subject is the broad spectrum of enhancement to pull everything together that we've heard and uh, let us reflect where do we want to go in this spectrum. Matthew over to you. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, nice to meet you. Can everyone hear me at the back? You can hear me? So a little bit in a similar valence to Sandrine, I want to introduce some personal considerations to do with this question of enhancement. Because like Sandrine, I think, our personal experience can really drive and motivate our research questions in a way which is unprecedented and much better than sort of abstract theoretical debate. So I was speaking to Natasha during the break and also uh, then listened to James's presentation, of course, and I think uh, what this presentation could have been called is something like transhumanism has an image problem, second part, subtitle, and how to rebrand it. So I'm going to say something about that. My answer to that will be, the clue is in the title, to do with thinking about transhumanism as part of a spectrum, a much broader spectrum of enhancement. And if we understand some things at the end of the spectrum, some very everyday things, then we're going to understand some of the central questions of transhumanism, which are often regarded within the public domain as a bit more scary. And the advantage of doing this is that many of the advantage of tra advantages of transhumanism can be more broadly shared with people that need them. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So I'm going to introduce myself and say a little bit about how I got to work on this topic. A little bit my, my previous work on self cultivation and now enhancement. Then I'm going to talk about this spectrum starting at the beginning with people like Claire Chambers, who's recently written a book on intact, really worth reading, Oxford University Press. Uh, it's all about a philosophical position on why we shouldn't enhance at all, which really is a good sort of uh, foil for many of the questions about why we should, which seem to be uh, interesting to many people in the self-care and wellness communities, communities that are not usually associated with transhumanism, but I think have got a lot of the similar themes and are overlooking on similar uh, subjects. And then we're going to talk about the value of collectively uh, viewing this spectrum as a spectrum and seeing this rebranding process take place when we're thinking about enhancement more generally and starting small and then getting bigger. Okay, so the spectrum, as I said, uh, Claire Mook, yeah, Chambers in Book on Intact, A Defense of the Unmodified Body, that's the subtitle. And when I teach this, uh, this stuff at Eindhoven, we start with cosmetic surgery at the beginning because that's something that particularly young people in their 20s can really relate to. I think we can all relate to it. I think I could certainly uh, uh, starting to think about it now. Um, but uh, yeah, so starting at this beginning of the spectrum and then going all the way up to things like the quantified self, thinking about wearables, thinking about measurements, which again, generationally, Gen Z are obsessed with these sorts of questions. Then thinking about digital well-being, psychopharmacy, again, these sorts of things. And James mentioned this in his presentation earlier about psychopharmacy and how uh, cognitive enhancements can be thought of in those terms and the legislative pathways that this opens up. And then thinking later about uh, brain, um, brain interventions and brain chip, brain computer uh, uh, interventions here. Okay, so enhancement and self-cultivation. So I started uh, being interested in this topic a very long time ago when I first read The Great Gatsby. So how many of you have read Great Gatsby? It's a very, very popular book. Now, right at the end of the book, some of you might remember that there's this sort of schedule that the narrator finds in Gatsby's notebooks. And it's this schedule where Gatsby records what he's going to do each day to create this character of Great Gatsby. So he started out as this person who had no pretensions to be uh, this, this famous figure, 
but he had this ambition. And through very ordinary things, like setting himself a time to get out of bed, to do exercise and uh, wall scaling, climbing, I think. And then he has all sorts of studies built into his day, and that's all before breakfast. Uh, and a, a series of general resolves. He has this idea of the person that he wanted to be at the, uh, the end, he, this Gatsby character, and he was able to create this character. And that really inspired me in my PhD work to think about self-cultivation, the idea that we can have an idea of who we want to become, and then we can go through a process of, of doing this. Now, of course, this process is very familiar to anyone who's interested in human enhancement, because it's a similar sort of idea. We have this goal outside of our everyday lived experience, and we realize that there are a process of steps, whether they be medical, digital, biological, that we can go through to attain this goal. And I think that sort of key idea really connects lots of things within, uh, within the, excuse me, within the, schedule, within the uh, spectrum of enhancement. It starts at the beginning with the same sort of logic and goes all the way to things like brain-computer interface. Okay, so the PhD took me, after looking at this idea, thinking of non-digital ways in which we cultivate our passionate attachments, to think about how this can be done digitally. And I did a lot of work on self-care apps, looking at how these apps can actually uh, create characters and personas that we wouldn't otherwise do. So the short takeaway from that Marie Curie work uh, was that actually the apps themselves are enormously effective at giving us the tools to nudge us to do various things, to behave in different ways, but actually uh, the our ethical ideals that they hold up, what they're nudging us towards, could use lots of insight from the philosophical tradition. So philosophers have been thinking about what makes a good life, what is a worthy thing to enhance about ourselves for a very long time. Apps give us a really uh, powerful means to do this. So connecting those two things up was very important. Okay, and then more widely looking at digital well-being and these questions again we're starting to go down on that spectrum, starting to go forward, thinking about what well-being is within the digital world. That seems to be a really important part of similar sorts of questions that the transhumanism movement asks, but actually they are given much more different answers within this self-care wellness space. Okay, so is there a spectrum of enhancement? Now, I think one way to illustrate this is to look at some very commercial but very everyday products. Many of us will own uh, a pair of ear earbuds, earpod, AirPods. So AirPods really created this sort of interface, I think, between uh, verbal and verbal content. And if you look around when you go outside in Utrecht, you'll see people cycling around with these little white things in their ears. Of course, we're all wearing them. And this idea that we need to be actually com constantly plugged in has become extremely commonplace now. No one would think of that in terms of a transhumanist sort of revolution or some sort of thing that's really going to affect how we think about uh, ourselves and our connection with the digital, but actually it creates quite profound opportunities to consume content, to receive, to be able to communicate with other people. I think this is already starting to uh, make a, the next turn in the screw will be with uh, the various different uh, visual products that have come out. We're looking at uh, the Vision Pro here, of course, which is the AR uh, offering from Apple. Um, so we're already starting with self-cultivation technologies, then we're going to these more enhancement technologies when we're really uh, integrating and we're really we're in much more of an um, immersive space. And then the question is, these more sort of out there trans, so-called transhumanist technologies are operating according to a very similar logic, but actually uh, the logic is the same and then we can learn from how these other sorts of technologies are promoted. So the precursors to transhumanism technologies, such as BCIs, which are already, which is maybe the sort of quintessential one, if you like, you know, most people would uh, at least consider putting a chip in their brain. They are already widely deployed, and this is why when Apple's Vision Pro came out, people were already talking about it as the first brain chip interface. And I think that's a very prescient comment to think of it not as just an entertainment device, but to think about it, this is how these ideals and these in, this, this interest in this movement is likely to come across. 
not through this revolutionary sort of language of something really different coming out there, are you on board or are you not? It's gonna be through marketing and through a commercial product like the Vision Pro, people wanting to use it to be able to communicate, to be able to work, to be able to share information. So I think that's how the transhumanist revolution will come about. Um, and what can we do to actually make sure that those sorts of ideals are more thoroughly grounded in the sorts of debates we have uh, within this community. So transhumanist technologies, things like brain-computer interaction are going to likely to start with the uh, Vision Pro, more likely than some sort of more far-fetched scientific scenario. Okay, so similarly to the self-cultivation technologies, online documentation of the use of things like uh, Vision Pro or AirPods and various different cosmetic procedures that people go through are widely documented on social media. So not only are content creators and influencers very important in disseminating powerful messages of how people could live, they also often dedicate lots of the content to the stages through which we get to these various different processes. So often cosmetic surgery influencers will not just show you the results, uh, the lips that have been done, whatever, but they'll go and show you the clinic where this is done. And this is a very emancipatory movement in some ways because it shows that we can all partake in it. And I think Generation Z, so-called Generation Gen Z, have been really instrumental in this procedure, partly because they are not interested so much with a picture of Cara Delevingne on the catwalk walking down the red carpet they're interested in a very amateurly shot video of her in the limousine, eating, eating chips with her friends, messing around, applying her makeup, and that sort of much more practical of what it's like behind the mask is something that's really powerful for this generation. Okay, so what's the value of collectively exploring the spectrum? Well, the value is that we're going to get to these very uh, these technologies that have the capacity to really give a lot of benefit to humanity much more quickly. So at the moment, I feel, and I think James's presentation really spoke to this, that transhumanism's image problem is to do with certain protagonists within that debate who are uh, unfortunately associated with certain right-wing ideals uh, okay, occasionally or very different sets of motivations for promoting the use of technology. And actually, these, that really interferes with the more widespread uptake of transhumanism. And I think we can avoid this problem if we think and we use a vocabulary that is more embedded within the enhancement, wellness, and self-care communities already. And actually, the quantitative self, measuring, using wearables, using apps, this is the way that the whole process is going to be more widely disseminated if we pay attention to what Gen Z or what younger members of these communities are going to want. Okay, so just to say a couple of words about the Claire Chambers book. Again, debates about the defense of the unmodified body, really, really interesting. I mean, it's not as uh, black and white as she, Claire Chambers makes it out. She's also somebody with a really good eye for what's gonna make a catchy title because she, she knows that we're all gonna want to cite her to tell her uh, why she's wrong. Um, but of course, these sorts of uptakes, and again, uh, the Heather Widow's book, Perfect Me, was critical of some of the cosmetic surgery ideals that are really, uh, which really animate so much of our visual culture today. Uh, these sorts of ideals are where the debate starts and where I would urge us all to think about at least locating some of the normative uh, discourse and argumentation when we're talking about transhumanism, starting at this right at the end of the spectrum, and then moving early on to think about how actually social media, particularly content creators and influencers, are going to be massively important in this Gen Z generation. Okay, so I'll just read this because it's one of my favorite studies which really started motivating me to start working on content creation more seriously. 
So it was a study done in 2019 by the Lego Group. Now since 1969, of course the year that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, the most popular career choice for the age group, eight to 12 year olds, has always been an astronaut. Now of course this is why Lego have been making uh, astronauts, because we all as children wanted to play, being astronauts for a very long time. In 2019 there was a shift and they noticed that actually the most popular choice, uh, 29%, um, was a YouTuber. Now this is historically unprecedented for a start, but also it should worry us all to some extent. It shows that being a YouTuber is enormously important, but of course, if you think about the content, what YouTubers do, often their work is enormously disruptive. Whereas if one wants to be an astronaut, when, is, when one is in that sort of age range between eight and 12, what does one do? One doubles down on science, maths, hard subjects, because that's what you need to be an astronaut. Every child knows this. And of course, everybody flakes out and they end up doing something else. But the social benefit accrued from that wide process of people wanting to become astronauts and then failing at it, is much more positive than wanting to become YouTubers. YouTubers, even if you're 8 to 12 years old, uh, you can still, the bar is very low and you can actually start your account. You may well have a smartphone at that age. I know my uh, young goddaughter at 10 years old, she has a smartphone now. Many kids have them earlier. Um, so when that happens, so the whole process kick start, is kick-started, which means that the ethical ideals of actually wanting to share content is started to be shared. Okay, so I think we need to take influencers very seriously, but also figures that young people, and particularly people when they get a bit older working in science universities, such as Elon Musk, are enormously popular. Now, however polarizing this figure is, the way in which these products are deployed, they're made applicable and they're made relevant for young people and the uptake of them is very great. This is something that we really need to be very careful of in the deployment and the propagation of transhuman ideals. Thank you.